Hello, my name is Vince Emanuele, and welcome to Park Media. Today, we have Peter Kuznick, Professor of History and Director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He is the author of many books, including Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists as Political Activists in 1930s America, and along with Oliver Stone, co-wrote a 12-part series on Showtime called The Untold History of the United States, which also has a companion book. Today, however, we are talking with Professor Kuznick about the Transnational COVID-19 Solidarity Manifesto. Professor Kuznick, thanks for being here. Happy to be with you, Vince. Well, as you know, Professor, we are in a terrible time, um, both politically, the global healthcare crisis, the crisis in global capitalism. Um, these crises seem to continue to compound, uh, and we are having a difficult time, I think, trying to find a response to this. One of the few responses that I've seen that really lay out a series of principles for how we can move forward is the project that you're involved with. So can you tell us a little bit about sort of the formation of the Transnational 19 COVID, uh, Transnational COVID-19 Solidarity Manifesto, and what was the thinking behind starting this project? driving force was really one of my colleagues at American University, David Vine. Some of the listeners might be familiar with David's work on American empire and American bases. David wrote a terrific book I've got here called Base Nation, which is really, um, he's, David is really the successor to Chalmers Johnson. Uh, and Chalmers Johnson had written about and warned about America's empire of bases and how the United States has this vast empire of 800 bases around the world, in addition to 6,000 or so, as you would know, here in the United States. So uh, it's a different kind of empire, the American empire. And David is one of the leading lights in terms of understanding it. David started to contact some of his allies and colleagues around the world and asked us to have a Zoom meeting to think about what we can do globally to try to influence the course of these events. And through a series of meetings, really over a couple months, we formed this coalition. And the thing I like about it in part is that it said, international coalition. We've got active participants in perhaps 20 countries, and we've reached out to people in many more than that. And so uh, we put together, worked through this manifesto, and the manifesto basically is the core bedrock principles that we all stand for, especially in terms of how we need to think about solving this problem. We go back to 2008, 2009, <clears throat> and there was no real changes made in the global structures that caused the collapse of 2008, 2009. We didn't want this to, to fall into that same trap. We've had crisis after crisis, but there has not been any kind of fundamental restructuring. So what we've been doing over the years is treating the symptoms. But what we need to be doing is getting at the core underlying problems that cause these conflicts. And we could say that in some ways, that's been the history of the United States in the 20th and 21st centuries. While we've sometimes, when we have crises, we can resolve them in a way that, in an immediate sense, that solves or lessens some of the problems, but they keep on recurring and they get worse. And now we're facing three kinds of existential crises and we're losing the struggle on all three fronts. So I know we'll have time to get into that. So what this manifesto represents is our attempt to lay out principles that can guide people all over the planet in how we're thinking about and understanding the problems ahead of us and the crisis that we're confronting. And so it, it, it start off our first sentence, the COVID-19 crisis has revealed the urgency of changing global structures of inequity and violence. 
So right from the beginning, it's differentiating us from people doing all this good work on the ground to try to deal with the current crisis. What we're saying is that there's underlying causes that have made this as bad as it is, as terrible as it is, then we proceed to lay them out. And the broader context is that we are living in this world of neoliberal economic policies that we can trace back at least to the early 1980s, to the Reagan-Thatcher period. <clears throat> and what they've done, this very, very predatory, inhuman form of capitalism is based on the assumption that the markets are supreme uh, and you can't mess with the markets and that the only thing you can do is pursue your maximum greed. And that somehow out of all these people pursuing maximum greed, then that will this will work for everybody. And what we've seen over the decades, and that's tied in with this fundamental mistrust of government. You know, in the 1950s and 1960s, people didn't have this attitude about government. And there are a lot of things that lead to that. And we can start to see, you know, my co-author Oliver Stone likes to trace it to the Kennedy assassination. I really trace it back further and Oliver and I do an untold history and we trace it back to the overthrow of Henry Wallace at the Democratic Convention in 1944 and his replacement by Harry Truman and then Truman becoming president when Roosevelt dies on April 12, 1945. But whatever the, whatever the starting point, what we see now is the misuse of government and then the mistrust in government. And so by the Reagan 1980s, the attitude was that government is not the solution to our problems, government is the cause of our problems. And this mistrust that's become so rampant toward government uh, in the United States, clearly, with the election of Donald Trump. But these neoliberal economic policies have gutted the institutions that were created and necessary to maintain life on our planet. So we see the destruction of the rainforests. We see the destruction of the safety nets all over the world, the health care systems all over the world and this enormous gap between rich and poor, a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest 3.8 billion people. And I can never get my mind around that figure. No. It's, and it's just, can imagine coming down from another planet to our solar system and, and seeing the way we organize our lives in this, on this planet. Mm -hmm. and, but that same thing is replicated within each nation. In the United States, the richest three people have more wealth than the bottom half of the population. That's right. And so we see, when you see a crisis like this, it's not surprising that it takes as such a, takes as a devastating toll on human beings all over the world because our systems, our defense systems, our support systems have been so badly weakened already. And so that's what we're confronting now. So we're trying to encourage uh, everybody who's making their efforts we're supporting the healthcare workers. We believe in uh, healthcare as a basic right of people everywhere. Uh, we are embarrassed about the situation in the United States, by far the most expensive and least effective healthcare system in the world in a lot of ways. We used to be able to say that there were two industrial countries that didn't have a national healthcare system, South Africa and the United States. But now even South Africa has a national healthcare system once they got rid of apartheid. And so we're left by ourselves looking so pathetic, so incompetent. The thought that the United States would have 100,000 dead from this, the United States would lead the rest of the world by far. You know, we like to say we're number one, but we never want to say we're number one in death, we're number one in bad health outcomes, right. but that's the pathetic situation that we're in now. And so that's what inspired us to do this manifesto, to try to come up with the core principles that could apply to people everywhere and try to give as much support, guidance, direction as we can to all these other great movements around the world. As you're speaking, I'm thinking of Chris Hedge's work, Death of the Liberal Class. I'm thinking part of, part of the challenge we've faced is what vehicle for change, in other words, 
there are people out there right now who are saying, look, can we reform the Democratic Party? There's people, say, you know, who worked with the Bernie Sanders campaign. And, and we were some of those people, you know. And the reason we worked with that campaign with as many flaws as it had, uh, particularly one being a lack of focus on U.S. empire and militarism and connecting those issues to austerity at home, but we saw it as an opportunity to organize and connect with ordinary Americans who don't otherwise identify as leftists, progressives, et cetera. And as organizers, we kind of have to go to where people are at. But as a good organizer once told me, you never leave them where they're at. So, you know, we tried to meet people, tried to bring people into the mix. I think a lot of people's hopes and dreams around reforming the Democratic Party have been shattered after this defeat of Bernie Sanders. Uh, whether those hopes and dreams were legitimate before we could have a, a different discussion about that. But what do you think in terms of how capable is the state apparatus in the United States to conduct the kinds of reforms that we think are needed? And we can go more in detail into the each points of, of the manifesto. But I'm, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of Chris Hedge's work. I'm thinking even here of Chomsky's work of, in terms of the U.S. sort of acting like a failed state. What do you think are the opportunities for these sorts of reforms through the state itself? And then is there another form of maybe activism or organization, alternative institutions that we could do in the meantime to sort of make up for this gap that we see the state apparatus sort of leaving people behind? I think in, we have to think of that in two ways or lots of ways. On the one hand, we've got an immediate crisis in front of us. And... What we have now in the Trump administration is a caricature of government. The in levels of incompetence uh, that we're dealing with now are costing people's lives. And not just few lives, we're talking about tens of thousands of lives. This report out of, I think it was Columbia, that showed that had Trump acted a week sooner, to enforce social distancing, wearing masks, or at least to urge it, that 36,000 people could have been saved. That's about what we lost in the Korean War on our side. You know, we lost 58,280 Americans in Vietnam. And that's, you know, we still haven't recovered from that. So the fact that so many tens of thousands, scores of thousands of unnecessary lives are being lost, not by just the structural problems that you and I are aware of, but by the, on top of that, this unprecedented level of incompetence and corruption on the part of the Trump administration means I think that we've got to confront this on two levels. And, and you get into the problem that we're always facing, you know, where do we, do, are we gonna always support the lesser of two evils? You know, and what does that, that do to us? Uh, on the left, progressives, uh, and, and how do we think about this in terms of the Sanders campaign, or even more now, how are we going to think about this in terms of the Biden campaign? Right. This is a, a discussion that so many of us have been having for a long time, certainly goes back to 2000. You fought in Iraq, two tours of duty there, right, and had uh, Gore been elected instead of Bush in 2000, and not that Bush was elected, I mean, he lost the popular vote, and then he was put into power by members of the Supreme Court who were chosen in administrations that his father was either president or vice president in, who installed George W. Bush. And then, I mean, in the insanity of the policies during the Bush, Bush years, the neoconservatives and their takeover a hostile takeover of the government. And we know the history of these folks. I don't know how much of the history you want to get into, but I think it's a very important history of how these neoconservatives organized, how they emerged, what their worldview is, and what the ongoing impact of that worldview is today, uh, whether it's even in the Trump administration or even during the Obama administration. So these, I think these historical threads are very important and still very, very relevant. So, uh, so the, the starting point that I have, uh, which is the debate that we have within the coalition, our solidarity coalition, it's the debate that we have within with my friends and allies, um, is as bad as both parties are, 
and to the extent in which they're both war parties, there is a big difference between them. And I think about this back in 1968 when I was a student uh, speaking at Teachings. And I remember my two favorite professors in 1968 at the teaching on the eve of the uh, election came out in support of Nixon and said people should vote for Nixon because the Democratic Party had been so corrupted by these liberal warmongers, these corporate interests, that they have to be punished. I took a more neutral stance of that, that, that um, teach-in. Uh, but the reality we know is had Hubert Humphrey gotten elected in 68, there would probably be 2 million more Vietnamese alive and many tens of thousands of Americans alive. It makes a difference. And I think the same thing happened in 2000 with Gore and Bush. Uh, the same thing, I mean, Biden, to me, represents the, the worst of the Democratic Party centrists. Biden, I think on most things, has a pretty bad record. Certainly uh, had a terrible record when it came to the Iraq war. And now the Democrats are trying to outdo Trump in their China bashing. The Biden's campaign ads are sickening. They're, they're appalling, repulsive uh, and when it comes to issues like China. But that same kind of thinking, as you know, is so deeply rooted in the Democratic Party. I go back to the early Cold War. I go back to McCarthyism. Truman knew that what the Republicans were doing was bullshit. Truman, in 1946, Carol Reese, the I think, chairman of the Republican Party, starts to say that this is the election is going to be uh, a choice between republicanism and communism. So as early as 46, that was the Republican line. And then they start attacking the, first they go after the atomic spies, and they say that that's the weakest link in America's national security. But then they immediately switch gears and focus, and they go after Hollywood. And how is Hollywood relevant? Well, Hollywood is relevant, we know, symbolically in terms of influencing people. And it was a hotbed of left liberalism and left wing thinking and politics. Uh, but so they go, but, and they start attacking this, these links or the weak links in our national security. And what does Truman do? He knew it was bullshit. According to Clark Clifford, his domestic policy advisor, Truman knew there was, this was baseless, that there's, that, that the uh, New Deal was not run out of Moscow and that the spies were not threatening the United States. But Truman, to try to get out ahead of that, uh, calls for these loyalty security hearings and people working for the government having to take pledges and sing God bless America and debase themselves in public. Uh, and But that was the problem. And then when it comes to foreign policy, then the Democrats again try to outflank the Republicans to show that they're not soft on these national security issues, which is where we get this bipartisan kind of foreign policy nightmare. So the, I mean, one of the themes that Oliver and I develop in Untold History is that really when it comes to foreign policy, there has not been a lot of difference between the Democratic hawks and the Republican hawks. And then you go into the Scoop Jacksons and, and those people really lead up to the neoconservatives of the George W. Bush era. So there's a lot to say to condemn the Democratic Party in that sense. But when we're looking at the 2020 elections, there are some big differences. And one of the big differences is one of the, t the existential threats that we're confronting, and that's global warming. And as bad as Biden is, <clears throat> and some of the people around him are, Biden is going to be in a different universe when it comes to deal with global warming than Donald Trump would be or has been. And this is a menace. And this is something that we keep pointing out is we're running out of time. And I don't think we can, we can chance another four years of Donald Trump on that issue alone. The second issue along those lines, we can get into this much more later, is that Biden will extend the New START Treaty when it expires in February 2021. And Trump likely will not. And we can get into the, that, that issue much more too. So I, so I see where you're going with this because it's a very important question and the Democratic Party is bankrupt and corrupt. But that doesn't mean 
that the differences between a Biden candidate and a Trump candidacy uh, are not real and, and palpable. Or even with regard to domestic policy. So as you mentioned, much more continuity between both major parties with regard to U.S. militarism, U.S. foreign policy empire. But even on the domestic front, the rabid attacks against Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those sort of attacks. I mean, what we're trying to get people to understand who are just getting involved with this is that getting people to think about power so who exactly has influence over power? Where do the two, both parties have different bases. Both parties are influenced and leveraged by different entities. So for instance, the unions can cause as much of a fuss as they want with a Republican in office, but they have very little sway over a Republican in office. The Democrats, to a lesser and lesser degree as time goes on, but they're still somewhat beholden to certain bases some of those bases like organized labor, environmental groups, and others still have sway within the party. I think we saw this back in 2012 with uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Barack Obama when Barack Obama wanted to cut Social Security and Bernie Sanders was in the Senate, you know, sort of threatening and so forth. There, there's a different power dynamic at play. And so you see defeating Donald Trump, I would agree with you, and I think most of the people in uh, our writing collective and also with the different organizations we're working with would agree that the primary sort of tactical goal in the next six months is to get Donald Trump out of office. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's urgent. I think it's essential. Um, we, I, we don't know if we can survive another four years of Donald Trump. That's right. In some sense, we've been lucky because he hasn't been quite the lunatic on foreign policy that many of us thought he would be. Uh, he could he he could be worse, you know, and and there have been a lot of people who have done worse things, but the potential for Trump to 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 do terrific nightmarish things exists right now, and when, and as you say, there's a very big difference when it comes to domestic policy. When we look at the periods of reform in the 20th century, and as light as they've been in the 21st century, they've been because farmers and workers have mobilized during the 1930s in the New Deal. Um, labor really, it was the rise of the labor movement that pushed the Democratic Party to the left. If we look at the early Franklin Roosevelt, he was not a great reformer. In fact, he ran in 1932 in many ways criticizing Herbert Hoover and the Republicans from the right for being fiscally irresponsible, for unbalancing the budget. But then he was pushed in a much more progressive direction and turned into a, a, a different kind of political leader. Uh, but the, part of our problem is that the labor movement has been so weakened by decades of attack by the Republican Party. And that used to be the base of progressivism within the Democratic Party. African-Americans have also provided a base of progressivism environmental groups, as you say, anti-nuclear groups. I mean, there's been uh, women's women's groups. Uh, I mean, we've got the progressive forces, but we always sell ourselves short. You know, we always say, well, we don't really have the support. But if you look at the issues, the American people support us on the issues. And now this coronavirus pandemic is making our interconnectedness so much more obvious on a global scale. And we're realizing that what happens in remote China in the city that most Americans had never even heard of is going to affect people all over the world. We are in a global community. We're global citizens. What are, you know, which, which was basically the message of the Einstein Russell manifesto in 1955, you know, think of your humanity first, forget the rest. And our, what uh, unites us, what connects us to people in Russia and China and Iran and Venezuela and everywhere else, North Korea, is much greater than what separates us now. And so what, what I've been trying to do in everything that I get involved in and what the coalition is trying to do is challenge those kinds of policies. We call for ending all universal blanket sanctions on other countries. We call for ending America's empire of bases. 
We call for a peaceful resolution of conflicts around the world. Uh, we call for cutting defense budgets, the, the military spending, at least by 50%, and putting those resources into health care and education and child care, the things that people really need. I mean, it's such a waste that so much of our discretionary budgets in every country go to warfare, go to perfecting the means of killing, go to this outmoded idea of national security. And so what we're trying to say is that we've got to begin to think about how we can change all of this. What is the perspective you're receiving from your friends overseas, your allies within this coalition? Are they facing some of similar challenges as we are in the United States? For instance, I speak with friends abroad, uh, some of whom in the EU and elsewhere. You know, we had great hope. I think some people had great hope with Syriza in Greece. Some people had great hope with uh, Podemos in Spain. I think a lot of the progressive left people that I speak with in many other nations, both industrialized nations and industrializing nations, I think also face a similar challenge. Is that the sense that you get from your friends abroad? And what are the similarities? What are the differences with the folks that you're speaking with? Uh, I I think we all are confronting a rise of right-wing populism that looks like a kind of neo-fascism. And so in some ways, the dangers are much greater than they had been before because uh, the response to Arab Spring and a lot of other changes, the Iraq war, um, invasion of Afghanistan, the disruptions caused by that, disruptions caused by developments in Syria, uh, especially in Libya, has created this flood of migrants which has triggered this right-wing nationalism in so much of the world now. And so I I think we're more threatened with a kind of neo-fascism around the planet than we've been since the 1930s and 1940s. And so I think everybody, while we're pushing to make radical, revolutionary, fundamental changes, we're also aware of the need to form broader alliances to protect what we have. Because we've lost, we're really losing ground globally. Latin America, when Oliver made his movie, South of the Border, his documentary, and there were all these progressive presidents and progressive governments throughout Latin America that have now been largely toppled. You know, we look at, look at Bolivia uh, and look at, I mean, all, all over Latin America. There was a time when we thought we were making real progress uh, and and, and a lot of that has been lost. But we know that this is cyclical and we know that this is gonna come back again. We're seeing in the United States with uh, even the Trump administration uh, that is a, you know, I think of the United States as a failed democracy. Um, Noam talks about it being a failed state. I think it's definitely a failed state but I also think of it as a failed democracy, a country in which 40% or so could support uh, orange haired, a carnival barker, who's so obviously a uh, you know buffoon and anti-human in every possible way uh, is, is, is so troubling and frightening to me. And the fact that people are so easily susceptible to being misled uh, and don't have, don't have a, a better understanding of what's happening and what needs to be done and don't have a broader sense of humanity. Uh, you know, and this is not just the United States. You look at what's happening in Eastern Europe. I had always hoped that at least the rhetoric of socialism would have some influence on people And so they would not fall back on their worst tendencies and instincts. But what we're seeing in many parts of Eastern Europe is a similar kind of reactionary response, a similar kind of bigotry, similar kind of hatred, similar kind of fear. We know that governments try to mobilize people based on fear and play them against each other. Trump is the master of this, scapegoating, you know, so... The, the, his, the United States response to this was an absolute disaster. And what does Trump do? 
He's blaming it on China. He's blaming it on the World Health Organization. The Republican Senatorial Committee put out a 57-page memo saying that the senatorial candidates should not spend their time defending Trump. They should instead spend their time attacking China and blaming China. And that's a page out of the Trump playbook. So in 2016, it's Mexico, or it's the Latin Americans, uh, you know, who are out to get us and destroy us. But now it's China who's out to destroy us. You know, there's always this scapegoating. It's always just playing on people's fears and insecurities. And we've known forever that that's the thing to do. You know, so the United States needs enemies. We need enemies abroad in order to justify this insanely bloated military budget. But Trump's whole political strategy is based upon this idea of building up these boogeymen who are out to get us and who are responsible for everything that he's fucked up on. And then able to crack down at home. Here I'm thinking of the historian Alfred uh, McCoy's work, you know, where the, the, the tactics of U.S. empire and the strategies of counterinsurgency are used abroad and then brought back home. So the enemies created giving us an excuse, of course, to go in and do what we're going to do. But then also all of those same tactics and approaches come back and are militarized at home. As a historian, you can give us, I think, a unique perspective into what are the parallels? We talk about this rise of right wing movements across the globe right now. We see Bolsonaro. We see I mean, we could go on and on Netanyahu and so forth. What is the parallels between the rise of the right today compared to the 1930s? And what are the differences and why are those important as well today? In the 1930s, we had, you know, the the American government, when it came to foreign policy, was also pretty backward. And, And it's understandable. But American isolationism in the 1930s shaped our response to fascism. One of the ironies was that when the Soviet Union entered the Popular Front period, you know, 1935 or so, Stalin changed lines from the third period. He was no longer attacking the Democrats and their al- similar kinds of movements around the world as social fascists. Now was reaching out to the West to be allies to stop Hitler. It was clear to Stalin and everybody else what Hitler's strategy was because he laid it out explicitly in Mein Kampf. And it was to move eastward into Ukraine, into Russia, to take to depopulate those areas, to repopulate them with Germans, uh, to destroy the Soviet Union, basically. And so in, when Hitler was gaining more and more power, Stalin reached out to the West and pled for alliances to stop, stop the spread of, of fascism. Uh, and the West didn't do it for various reasons. In the United States, uh, the, we had the opportunity to cut Hitler off at the knees. And that was with the Spanish Civil War. When yeah. Franco forces, militarily backed by Italy and Germany, tried to destroy the Spanish Republic. They could have been defeated there, but the United States maintained what Roosevelt described at the time or later as a dumb neutrality. And we weren't allowed to give aid to the Spanish democratically elected, very progressive Spanish Republic. Americans went over there and fought in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Very brave Americans, many of whom were killed fighting there for against fascism. But the United States as a nation didn't support it. And then you get these people like Churchill who was supporting the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, And so we lost that opportunity to stop the the spreading of fascism in Europe at that point and then in Northern Africa. Uh, But the United States still represented something positive on the world scene, uh, even though it blundered terribly when it came to Spain. Question now is who is gonna really stand up to these kinds of movements. Um, for example, I, I do a lot with Russia. Um, I went to Russia many times during the campaign, the 2016 campaign. And most of my Russian friends and colleagues 
were indeed supporting Donald Trump. And I had a meeting after Trump was in office with a friend of mine who is a top member of the Russian Senate uh, and was a possible replacement for Putin if Putin decided not to run again before the last election, which obviously didn't happen. Uh, a very, very bright, worldly, progressive guy, speaks multiple languages. And I asked him, why did he and everybody else support Trump? Because uh, I would go to these conferences. I'd be the only one there often uh, saying that as bad as Hillary Clinton is, and I thought she was terrible, she would be much safer for Russia and the world than the totally irrational, reckless Donald Trump with his finger on the proverbial nuclear button. And this, this my Russian colleague said, uh, Peter, we supported him for one reason, and one reason only, that he said he wanted to be friends with Russia. Okay, I can understand that from a narrow perspective, but I was very disappointed because I expect them to be looking at it the way I would look at it. For me, the best thing that happened to the United States is for Russia to prosper and to have good leadership and work with us to make this a better world. Uh, and I would hope that they would have the same attitude toward the United States and we get into asymmetrical warfare, but many of them don't. Um, so, I mean, we, so we face, but uh, well, the point I was starting to make was that even Russia, and we just two weeks ago celebrated Victory Day. The last three years before the coronavirus, I was able to take students to Russia to commemorate Victory Day. And I know the way the holiday is used instrumentally by the Russian government in order to prop up a certain kind of military heroism. Uh, but we don't go to that parade. We go to the Immortal Regiment Parade and we celebrate the victory of, over fascism. So I've brought several dozen students in recent years uh, to, to be able to, to share in that. And Russia's main contribution in the 20th century was the fact that they played the prominent role in defeating Hitler and fascism. Uh, we'll get into that story in a minute. Uh, but so when I so I say at these meetings, you know, how much it troubles me, disgusts me to see even Russia so often in bed with these right-wing forces in France, in Hungary, in other countries, that Russia, given what it should be so proud of and what it contributed in the 20th century should be the last country to ever support these neo-fascist movements. But Russia is a very conservative country and in ways that distress me quite a bit. But get, getting back to this other point of it, um, it, one of the things that, that I find as a historian very upsetting is how ignorant the American people are. It's the level of historical amnesia and just basic ignorance is appalling to me. Uh, in the, the National Report card issued in 2007, the area in which American high school seniors came in lowest was not math and science. We know how pathetic Americans are when it comes to math and science. The reason the area they came in lowest in was US history. Only 12% of American high school seniors were judged to be quote unquote proficient in US history. Not knowledgeable, not outstanding, proficient, 12%. But even that is questionable because only 2% could identify what the Brown versus Board of Education case was about, even though it was obvious from the way the question was worded. So Americans know very little. I did an anonymous survey with college students. These were all A students in high school. And I anonymous survey asked them how many Americans died in World War II. The median answer I got was 90,000. So there were only 300,000 or so off. I asked them how many Soviets died in World War II. The median answer I got was 100,000. So there were only 27 million off. They had no idea what World War II is about. They had no idea what the Cold War is about. They have no idea what's going on in Ukraine. They can't understand this. Americans are historical ignoramuses. And the chief ignoramus is the guy sitting in the White House. <laughs> He issued that tweet, you know, saying, congratulating the United States and Britain over the, uh, on, the, on their victory over German fascism. What the United States and Britain contributed, but 
clearly it was the Russians, the Soviets who defeated fascism. And throughout most of the war, the US and the British were facing 10 German divisions combined, while the Soviets were facing more than 200 German divisions. 80% of the German losses were on the Eastern Front. Even Churchill said the Red Army tore the guts out of the German war machine. You know, they were the ones, they stood up and we recognized it at the time. Look at the New York Times saying, if we defeat fascism, if we're not in slavery to the fascists, then the credit goes to the heroic people in the Soviet Union. But then, you know, Americans don't know that. Most of them, many Americans don't even know that the Soviets and the U.S. were allies. Right. But, but we, what we should be doing is drawing on those memories and that history in order to be reaching out again saying, well, we have a lot of differences. Maybe there are a lot of things about your government that we don't like and our government that you don't like, but what unites us, you know, what should be uniting us, given our common enemies, uh, should be much stronger, more powerful than what divides us. And the same thing with the United States and China now. Anyway, so we don't draw the right lessons, we don't learn the history, and we repeat the mistakes. You know, as Joe and Lai once said, the charming thing about the American people is that they have absolutely no historical memory. Well, Santayana, George Santayana, the philosopher said, a nation without memory is a nation of madmen. I don't know if the United States is quite a nation of madmen, but we have more than our share of those creatures. Uh, and uh, and we, you know, we, we see how, what they're doing and how easily manipulated they are and how little the Americans know. Um, you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite comments is by Samuel Huntington. I don't usually agree with Samuel Huntington on much, but he did say one time, he said, the West won the world, not by the superiority of its ideas or religion or values, but by the superior application of organized violence. Westerners often forget that fact. Non-Westerners never do. You know, but Americans just can't. The other thing, aside from not having any historical understanding, is that Americans lack the ability to see the world through the eyes of our adversaries. And that's such a crucial thing to have. You know, we do not understand how the world looks to the Russians or how the world looks to the Chinese what it means to undergo a century of humiliation, what it meant for the Russians to deal with what they've had to deal with throughout the past uh, 100 plus years now. You know, so when you have rare leaders who have that ability, like uh, Franklin Roosevelt or a Henry Wallace or a John Kennedy in the last year of his life after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that's a, a, a trait, a skill, an ability, a sensitivity that's so necessary for leaders. And Bernie Sanders had that to a large extent. I haven't seen any of it in Biden, unfortunately. And Trump, of course, is laughable in that regard. But you look at John Kennedy that last year, and you look at and one of the things that I like to point to now, or now like, don't like what we're doing, but one of the things that we should be doing is having a combined global effort to find a vaccine to this pandemic, to coronavirus. How can we not be working with scientists in China and Russia and everywhere around the world, India, and, uh, to, to work together on this? But like everything else, Trump has turned this into a national competition. Make America great again. Make America healthy again. Screw the rest of them. Um, Kennedy made a speech in September of 63, two months before his death, assassination, in which he said, why should the race to the moon be a matter of national competition? You have to remember, this was Kennedy's signal initiative that he was so proud of. We were going to put a man on the moon. Uh, and he said uh, that we sh this shouldn't be a matter of national competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. We should be working together to put a man on the moon jointly, working with all the other countries in the world. This is in the interest of all mankind. It should not be a matter of national competition. But he had that same attitude. They're pushing the first uh, nuclear arms control agreement, the partial test ban treaty. 
That's why he was talking about pulling U.S. troops out of Vietnam. That's why in his great commencement address at American University in June of 63, he talks for ending the Cold War. I mean, you go right down the line, one issue after another, and Kennedy had this vision of changing the world, really, which Khrushchev shared. Khrushchev wrote Kennedy a letter after the Cuban Missile Crisis, because the lesson that they both drew from that was not that brilliant statesmanship saved the day, but we were saved by pure blind luck. The two of them, as much as they desperately tried to prevent a, a nuclear war, they both realized that the crisis was out of control. And so Khrushchev writes this letter to Kennedy saying, our countries have both felt the burning flames of nuclear war. Let's take this horrible incident, this crisis, and turn it into something positive. Let's eliminate every conflict between us that could ever cause a, conf a crisis like this again. And Kennedy was slow to respond, but he did finally respond. And then they were working together and Kennedy gets assassinated and Khrushchev gets toppled. And since then we've had but it's almost 60 years of nightmarish kinds of foreign policy uh, in the aftermath of that. And I think that was the last real chance we had. There were moments when Gorbachev, uh, even working a little bit with Reagan and George H.W. Bush made an effort. There was a moment when Barack Obama uh, was elected that we thought there was hope for going a very different direction. We were very, very, also disappointed with what came of the Obama administration. Uh, but those moments come up again, uh, and which is why one of the things that Oliver and I do did and what our Corona Solidarity Group is trying to do now is be ready when that kind of moment comes again. That's why we have to know because those moments will come again. And that's why we study so much, we put so much emphasis on Henry Wallace, because the one real visionary politician of the 20th, 20th century in the United States, uh, even more so than Kennedy, much more so than Roosevelt, but the one person close to power who really did try to change the world was Henry Wallace. And if Wallace had gotten the nomination again, because Wallace was vice president from 40 to 44, and it's so fascinating because in 40, Roosevelt writes a great letter to the Democratic Party convention. And he said, we already have one conservative, Wall Street dominated, money dominated party in the United States, the Republicans. If the Democrats don't reject that philosophy and stand for liberal and progressive values and social change, then the Democratic Party has no reason to exist. And if you don't give me Henry Wallace as my vice president in 1940, then I'm going to turn down the nomination for the president. And Roosevelt was dead serious. He was going to turn down the nomination for the presidency for a third term in 1940. And finally, the party bosses gave in and, put, and allowed Wallace to become Roosevelt's running mate. Roosevelt knew we were on the verge of a war against fascism, and he wanted the leading anti-fascist in the administration, Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace, on the ticket. So he knew what we were in for. And Wallace played that role uh, and during that time. When Henry Luce says the 20th century must be the century, the American century, and the United States should dominate the world, Wallace responded as vice president and made a speech saying the 20th century must be the century of the common man. He called for a worldwide people's revolution in the spirit of the American revolution, the French revolution, the Latin American revolution, the Russian revolution. And he called for ending monopolies and cartels ending colonialism and imperialism. You know, Wallace had a lot of enemies as vice president. The British and the French colonialists hated him. Uh, Churchill had Roald Dahl, the later child, children's writer, spying on Wallace. Uh, the Wall Street interests hated him. Wallace said, America, he said, America's fascism are those, fascists are those who think Wall Street comes first and the American people come second. His enemies included the misogynist, Wallace was the big supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment and fundamental rights for women. His enemies included the racists. Wallace was the leading spokesperson in the Democratic Party against racism and uh, against bigotry. 
Wallace had the votes at the 44 convention of all the black delegates uh, unanimously, as well as the labor delegates unanimously. Wallace, I mean, Wallace represented everything that was good about America. And the party bosses ran what the party treasurer, Edwin Pauley, called Pauley's coup, and they got Wallace off the ticket in 44. But we came so close because Wallace made the seconding speech for Roosevelt at the convention. And they, in fact, you have to realize the context. Gallup issued a poll of potential Democratic voters on the eve of the convention, July 20th, 1944, in your city in Chicago, at Chicago Stadium. And they asked potential Democratic voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% of potential Democratic voters said they wanted Henry Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. You know, you do the math. You know, well, that's 65 to 2. But the party bosses controlled the convention. And Roosevelt was too weak to fight for Wallace at this point, like he had in 1940. And they railroaded uh, and ramrodded uh, Truman through. Had Wallace become vice president and then president, there would have been no atomic bombings in 1945, no Cold War, certainly not of the sort that we saw. Uh, the world would have been different. So that's why I think we have to be ready when those moments come because we weren't ready in 1944 and 1945. Wallace stayed in the cabinet till September 1946 as Secretary of Commerce and fought against the Cold War and fought against the ar nuclear arms race until Truman finally fired him. And at that point, all hope was lost. And we know what that subsequent history was. And you mentioned two periods of history that were these decisive uh, moments. This is, we have on one end, 2000 Gore versus Bush, uh, another moment you mentioned, of course, is 1944. How about 1900 with McKinley and, and Jennings Bryant and, of course, the the, the uh, other candidate uh, who no one likes to remember but who's one of my favorite figures in American history, and that's Eugene V. Debs. Um, and then also another figure who you might see over uh, my right shoulder, and that's Smedley Butler, um, a personal hero of mine, of course, also a, a fellow Marine. But this goes back even further than, say, 1944, um, can, can you maybe, and I know this wasn't the, the purpose of this particular conversation, but I'm having fun simply asking you questions and listening to this history. And can we, can we talk? Cause I think there's, how do I put this? There's a sense, I think among some progressives that U S empire starts after world war II. Um, I think the reality is different. I think you'll, you could obviously speak to that much better than I can, but can you talk a little bit about that period before and, of course, another consequential election in the year 1900? <clears throat> yeah. Um, 1898 is an important turning point in American history. Uh, the Spanish-American War. You know, the first battle in the Spanish-American War takes place in Manila Bay. Uh, and the United States not only effectively takes over Cuba, after driving the Spanish out. But the United States uh, soon takes over the Philippines. Aguinaldo was leading a democratic uprising insurgency in the Philippines. And the Filipinos were hoping that America, United States, given its rhetoric and its anti-colonial traditions, would support Filipino independence. But the United States under McKinley took the opposite course. And it's, that's a, such an important turning point because it's from that point that the United States goes from being a supporter of progressive reform around the planet to becoming a supporter of the status quo, the leading status quo power in the world really from that point on. And we have, have this counterinsurgency war in the Philippines, which which t kills vast numbers of Filipinos and sets the United States on the wrong path. During the 1900 election, William Jennings Bryan, and Bryan is an unfortunate case because he, what he's mostly remembered for now is his opposition to teaching evolution and the role that he plays in the Scopes trial in Tennessee in 1925. But the uh, 
Brian was really a progressive. And he runs in 1896 after making his uh, his humanity uh, on a on a what was it, a cross of gold uh, speech there at the 1896 convention becomes is the boy orator. And in 1900, he runs against McKinley on the idea that the United States has to choose between being a republic and being an empire. And he comes out strongly on the side of the United States being a republic. But the American people made a choice. I mean, women couldn't vote. Very few African-Americans could vote in that year. And McKinley triumphs. McKinley is then assassinated and is replaced by Teddy Roosevelt. Very colorful figure, but when it comes to foreign policy, not a very uh, good choice either. Uh, and the United States starts intervening all over Latin America. So we not only maintain our military presence in the Philippines, but then we start invading all these and intervening and, colon and not colonizing, but controlling all these Latin American governments. And Smedley Butler, as America's most decorated Marine, is involved in one, one episode after another. And he says he became a high priced errand boy for Wall Street, basically. You know, he was the representative of the Brown Brothers Bank in Nicaragua, and they overthrow the government in Nicaragua for Brown Brothers and banking interests. And he goes through it one country after another until he finally said he'd had enough of it. And he writes his book, War is a Racket, and speaks out so strongly, so passionately. But he also ties into what we are talking about before, about American fascism in the 1930s, yeah. because there were fascist elements that tried to get him as the most popular, highly decorated Marine in the country uh, to be to lead this fascist uprising and overthrow the Roosevelt administration. And instead of leading it, he exposed it and denounced it. And then there were congressional hearings on it. And the committee said that basically everything that he had charged was true. And we did have a strong right wing element in the United States during this time. And it was around uh, DuPont and it was around, I mean, there were a lot of right wing business interests. And the other side of the sort of story is that many of these American business interests had ties with the, the Germans, had ties with the Nazis, and it, even after it became clear how ugly this, this regime was in Germany, even after Kristallnacht, they didn't stop. We knew the anti-Semitism, we knew the ugliness, we knew that they were gearing up for war, and Ford and GM helped them prepare for war. So you have Ford work, and you've, I mean, you've got these American corporations that are somewhat veiled because now you've got German leadership, but the Americans were producing this. Henry Ford was, was the ugliest example. Ford had been printed a million copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, this horrible re reactionary anti-Semitic screed that they were putting out around the world about this Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Everybody knew it was a, or should have known it was a forgery, and Ford was pushing this. Uh, Ford's po photo was up on the wall on Hitler's wall above his desk. Hitler said, "Henry Ford is my hero." Now Ford was not a an outright Nazi, perhaps, but he was awarded, decorated by the the Germans, as was leaders of GM and IBM and other corporations. So yeah, this is an ugly part of the history. George George W. Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, was also. Uh, involved with this and later gets denounced in the Trading the Enemy Act. And so there's a, a lot of very ugly history that, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the right wing forces in the United States. But as you say, this goes back way before World War II. I mean, American history, beginning with genocide of the Native Americans and through all those decades of American wealth being generated through horrific forms of slavery. <laughs> You know, we, we've got a, a history that we've got to understand. A history, on one hand, some beautiful ideals and visions and a lot of things to be proud of. On the other hand, so many things to atone for and to factor into. I mean, why is it that the average African-American family today has between 5 and 10% the wealth of the average white family? I mean, what are these patterns of of slavery and racism, and then uh, segregated housing, 
during the, in the, during the New Deal, the FHA programs, the redlining of districts, most of the, of the white wealth is in housing, which blacks were denied f through, still in a, in a lot of ways being denied. So we've got this history that in some ways is very ugly. That's why Oliver Stone and I wrote the untold history of the United States. You know, partly because we saw the lies that were still being propagated in American schools. Oliver looked at his daughter's high school textbook. That is the same crap that he was learning in the 1950s and 1960s. And so, you know, so we decided we were going to do this project. We had been friends for some time already and talked about history and politics and talked about projects together. And then, you know, we decided to do this and so to do the 12 episodes and write the what was then a 750 page book the new edition is now uh, more than 900 pages so it's a big book uh but it's also out we also got the uh, concise untold history based on the documentary skip strips we've got two of the four volumes of our young readers book uh version of untold history out we've also got the where um the graphic novel is on the way it's going to be oh, delivered cool. to the publisher this year the graphic novel and be out hopefully early next year so we're trying to you know get us out to as many different communities in as many different forms as possible uh, and you know and, but again it dovetails so much with the global solidarity manifesto um, which is our attempt to build the kind of transnational movement that can both mirror and reflect, but also expand an image of not make America great again and make Russia great again and make China great again, but reaching out. You know, the, we have to work together to solve global warming. Uh, we have to work together to end the nuclear arms race and the threat of war. You know, just to go off on that for a minute, just last week, the United States pulled out of the Open Skies Treaty. Look at the history that we've had since 2002 when we pulled out of the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missiles Treaty. And then, uh, then, we, then in 2018, we tear up the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. 2019, we pull out of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF. Uh, 2020, Open Skies. February 21, 2021, the, uh, the New START Treaty uh, expires. Putin has beg begged Trump to renew it for another five years. Trump has said he doesn't like the treaty. Well, the Trump people don't like any treaties. They don't want anything that's going to constrain the United States. If we look at the reality now, there are 14,000 nuclear weapons in the world. If we eliminate the last piece of scaffolding of the nuclear architecture, we are going to very likely go back to a 1980s style nuclear arms race. What was the reality then? There were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world, the equivalent of 1.5 million Hiroshima bombs of destructive capability. Trump says, I don't fear an arms race. I welcome one. He says, we're going to outspend everybody. We're going to win this nuclear arms race. Nobody wins in a nuclear arms race. It just and, and once we uh, take off the constraints, what's going to keep other countries from uh, abiding by the agreement in the NPT not to develop it? Trump is also just calling for discussing the possibility of starting nuclear testing again. Yeah, you know, so so we're going to convince North Korea not to test again if we're testing again, right. Russia not to, to test again. So we're faced again with this kind of nuclear anarchy, which is simply insane. You think of it, what we knew back then, what we know now. In the 1980s, when Carl Sagan and other scientists came up with the idea of nuclear winter based on their studies of hurricanes uh, on Mars and, and I mean, other astronomical studies, they realized that in the event of a nuclear war, when the cities burn, then that sends up the smoke and soot into the atmosphere and it stops the sun's rays. But the latest scientific findings actually show that Sagan and company even underestimated the risk in the 1980s. The latest findings say that even a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan 
in which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, would, would send five tons of smoke, five million tons of smoke and soot into the stratosphere. Within a week or two, they would circle the globe, block the sun's rays from hitting the earth, send the, the temperatures on the earth's surface plummeting, destroy much of the earth's agriculture, and even that limited nuclear war could lead up to two billion deaths. Two billion, a hundred Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons. We've actually got 14,000 nuclear weapons, most of which are between seven and 80 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. And so, you know, we can't play games with this. How, how unlikely is a war between India and Pakistan? We've come very close on several occasions, and there were just those t- the terrorist attacks in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, India, and we almost went to war again. They bombed each other very recently. So, um, you know, th- so this is a very, very dangerous situation there. And that's what, what we're, we're, we're trying to deal with. I, I've done speaking, three speaking tours in India in the last couple of years. And, and we think of that both in terms of the nuclear threat, but in terms of the pandemic. If you've been to India, you see that the poverty is ubiquitous, that the healthcare systems are weak. Sanitation, you know, they don't even have, they still have outhouses in much of the, the country. Um, there's not even indoor plumbing in much of the country yet. Uh, and people live in these, these areas right, right on top of each other. I mean, one of my big fears is that if this kind of coronavirus starts spreading in India, uh, it's going to wreak incredible havoc. And what we know, you know, as, as a historian, I've studied the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. And I know that the first wave, which began, it was not, you know, it's a misnomer to call the Spanish flu epidemic. It was called, we call it that. Yeah, begins in, in Kansas, among other places, uh, and it spreads. But the first phase of it was relatively mild. It's the second phase that begins in military camp in Boston, outside of Boston in September of 1918. It's that second phase that's so devastating when about 175,000 people were killed in October of 1918 alone in the United States. But between 20 and 100 million people globally, 675,000 in the US. And then the third wave is not as bad as the second wave, but it's also devastating. We're very likely to be hit with several waves of this again. You know, so it all ties together. The poverty on a global scale, the infringement upon nature, the constant encroachment upon nature that we're seeing, uh, the wrecking and plundering of healthcare systems, and the spread of disease, and not just disease, you know, just rampant poverty in a world in which so many people are so ill-equipped to be able to deal with this. Maybe which the United is States are lucky, but you know, even here we're not equipped to deal with it. But imagine what it's like in the favelas, in the ghettos in Brazil. Oh, or we've been reading about Gaza. Gaza, yeah, yeah. the horrible, yeah. you know, outdoor concentration camp yeah. in 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 Gaza. You know, we have in our coalition, we have Israelis, and we have Palestinians. We. Uh, um, there was just a, an article, a very, very nice article about our effort in Jerusalem Post yesterday. And a very laudatory article in which they stress the fact that uh, there are constant, you know, people like me, whose rel- most of whose relatives were killed in the Holocaust. And then there were people like Rhonda, Randa, who's a Palestinian born and, you know, very active member. And, and we and we did our launch yesterday in multiple languages, and Randa did it in Palestinian. She gave her talk in English, and then in in Arabic, um, not Palestinian Arabic. Uh, but we had it in Japanese, we had it in Spanish, we had in the and our manifesto is up in so many different languages, because that's what we're about. That kind of attempt to build a global movement. 
And I'm thinking about those connections as well. You have the systematic underdevelopment through colonization in India. Then you have this hyper redevelopment under neoliberalism. And then as a result of U.S. militarism, I wanted to get your thoughts specifically on this. How much is the drive to develop nuclear weapons on behalf of some nations a direct response to U.S. militarism? So I know there, you know, there's, at least as I understand it, there is a view in the world that if you have nuclear weapons, there's a much less chance that the United States would, in, in fact, invade and occupy your country. Um, so, so thinking again about your point about how all of this is connected and how all of these problems sort of feed off of each other. I, mean, I think you'll take the case of North Korea. Um, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, North Korea's official newspaper said that the only mistake that Saddam Hussein made was not to have nuclear weapons. If Iraq had nuclear weapons, the United States would never have invaded. Think about the situation with North Korea. What prevented Trump from invading in 2017? It was the fact that North Korea had weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, and also the fact that they had all of that artillery in, uh, lined up there on the border and could easily reach Seoul, a city of what, 25 million, including a couple hundred thousand American troops there. Um, we knew that the devastation would be, could potentially be unbelievable. There were some estimates that up to a million people could die in the first day of the war. And yet Trump was seriously pushing for it and sending the carriers to, to out, to, off of Korea and doing the war drills and the war games or the decapitation drills of the North Korean leaders. Uh, the, Richard Haas, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, thought things had become so bad in late 2017, he said he thought there was a 50-50 chance that the United States was gonna to go to war with North Korea. We were terrified, you know, and then Trump pulls back, fortunately. I mean, one thing about Trump, and it's so hard to understand, the guy's such a bully, but if you stand up to him, he, he, he collapses and you know, has been pushing for this war with Iran, uh, but you know, it doesn't seem to actually want to want to do it. I, I don't quite understand everything about Trump's psychology, but I understand enough of it, I guess. But um, but we've been lucky because you know these these situations are not a game. These are very very dangerous situations, and we've come very close to wars. Uh, in, in Syria, in Eastern Europe. I mean, there's a reason why the bullet and the atomic scientist in January of 2018 moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. They had done that once before in 1953 after the US and the Soviet Union tested the hydrogen bombs. They moved the hands to two minutes before midnight and it lasted there for a while. Uh, but then things eased and they moved it much further back. But in January 2018, in the aftermath of what's going on in North Korea and Trump's crazy militarism and the fact that the U.S. just announced that month, Mad Dog Mattis, General Mattis, said that the main threat to America's national security is no longer international terrorism, it's Russia and China. That's Altogether, right. that created such a toxic environment that they moved the hands to two minutes before midnight. Well, in February of this year, they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to uh, 100 seconds before midnight, the closest we've ever been to nuclear annihilation. And, and, and that's, you know, I agree with them that the world is just so unbelievably dangerous right now and that we've got to ease, ease these tensions. And so Trump, instead of attacking China, needs to be, and, and that doesn't mean that we're not gonna be critical of China, I don't like, I wouldn't want to live in a country that's got 300 million surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. I don't like what's happening with the Uyghurs. I mean, I don't like the fact that they want to crack down again on Hong Kong. And I don't like the authoritarianism in China, but I don't think we're going to make any headway in improving things for the people of China by making the Chinese leadership to turn, vilifying them, demonizing them like we've been doing with Putin in recent years 
and then creating this confrontational policy toward them. That just gives them more of an excuse to crack down on their people. So, so I think the U.S. policy has got to fundamentally change. And that's one of the things that you know, we're trying to do with our coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 Global Solidarity Manifesto. I think there's a sense among some people on the left that because of the sort of integrated nature of modern capitalism, especially 21st century capitalism, that there's that that the United States and Russia and China and sort of the the major pl- power players on the world scene are willing to play these little games, but that they're not necessarily willing to go to war with each other. Do you think this is a naive view or do you understand why some people on the left, I think, have expressed this? And is this a view that you've heard in the past? Because I hear this regularly from people who say, well, you know, China, the United States buys 45%, whatever it is, 40, 45% of their consumer goods. So they rely on us to buy their goods, so on and so forth, willing to play these little games, willing to have these skirmishes. But don't worry, there's never going to be a major war. We would never go to war with China. We would never go to war with Russia. How naive does that sound to you as a historian of of, uh, foreign policy, uh, wars, and so forth? I hope they're right. I mean, I, so do I. I, I hope they're right. Uh, I just don't want to base the future existence of the human species on the bet that they're right. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there are two people right now who have the capability of ending all life on the planet within minutes, basically. Uh, and I don't think anybody should have that capability, whether it's Vladimir Putin or it's Donald Trump or even Bernie Sanders. I don't think anybody should have that capability. And it's what the thinking behind that uh, reminds me a lot about of deter- deterrence theory during the old Cold War. The idea that you know deterrence theory works up to the point where it stops working. And then there's nobody around. As Kennedy said, you know, if I listen to the generals during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if I listen to generals, There'll be nobody left alive to tell them, to tell them they were wrong. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about deterrence theory. You, you know, maybe it, it works, but if it ever stops working, then there's nothing, then it's over. Then it's over. The stakes are too high. The U.S. and Russia have a couple thousand weapons on hair trigger alert pointed at each other. A couple thousand. So, if, you know, how many times we've had false readings of incoming missile attacks where Russians um, have, have gone to the verge of sending a counterattack against the United States. Stanislav Petrov and others have saved the day on numerous occasions. 1995 is a joint U.S.-Norwegian rocket launch that the Kremlin interpreted as an incoming IBM attack. We, and they, they woke Yeltsin up in the middle of the night. We don't know how many quarts, gallons of vodka were in him that night. And he, fortunately, he didn't, but he could have. And, you know, in Trump, if there's a similar kind of situation, the United States is sending freedom of navigation operations into the South China Sea to test the Chinese. Recently, there was, we came 45 yards from a collision between the Chinese warships and the American warships. You know, we're we're pushing these confrontations. You look at Eastern Europe. We've recently sent 5,000 more NATO troops into Eastern Europe. They're on the border with the the Russians are there in Kaliningrad. The Russians put nuclear-tipped Iskander missiles into Kaliningrad. You've got the United States on one side. You look at the situation in Syria. Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that if the United States put up uh, a no-fly zone in Syria, he has no doubt there's going to be war between the United States and Russia. And that's what Hillary Clinton was advocating, putting up a no-fly zone in Syria. The situation, I mean, we we look at these uh, situations and we realize how dangerous they are. So I hope that people who say that are right. I don't like to be a Cassandra I don't like to be preaching doom and gloom. I'd rather be preaching, you know, free love and community and, you know, and art and, you know, all the things that we love about life. 
Uh, but I want to make sure, I think we're in a transitional period. And the, the transitional period is a period when we have the moral and ethical standards of the barbarians of the dark ages and the technology of the people of the future, which means that we're very backward in a lot of ways, but we have the capability of blowing ourselves up, of ending life on the planet. And Einstein recognized the problem, and I think a lot of us do. And so until we eliminate the existential threats that confront us, uh, I, I don't think there's a lot that we can do really to, to make the kind of progress that, that we'd like to see. But I think we should work on both levels. I applaud everybody's efforts to deal with the immediate crisis here and now. I just know that my, from my, what I can contribute is much more my understanding of history and the bigger picture about the existential threats that really are, 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 are very real and, and very dangerous. We don't know what would have happened if Richard Haas was right and the United States and North Korea went to war in 2017. And that we, a lot of people said we'd have to use nuclear weapons in order to destroy the uh, North Korean weapons that were in those deep underground bunkers. And what does China do then? Right. What does Russia do? I mean, how do these things escalate? We saw what happened with World War I, how in these kinds of entangling alliances, country after country got drawn in, yeah. not because they wanted to, but because uh, of these alliances. Well, we still live in a world of those kinds of alliances. And the things escalate out of control very, very quickly. And that's not even mentioning all the accidents that can happen, all the inadvertent ways that we could go to war. In that broader perspective, for me, as someone who largely spends his time doing organizing work in the past, have, doing, have done a lot of writing and speaking publicly and so forth around the war in Iraq. But as people who are organizing, I'm telling you, Professor, having people who can provide a broader perspective is so essential and why it's so essential is because those of us who are organizing more often than not do not have the time <clears throat> do not have the time or the capacity to sit down day after day especially when you're in the midst of a campaign you've got people coming in and out people calling you you're trying to schedule events fundraiser you know i mean you you were active yeah, as a, been you've been, been there. there so so i think one yeah, of the people as like me who are doing some of the broader theorizing are, are equally dependent on people like you to, to do the, you know to do that grassroots organizing because it's not that one is more important than the other it's the symbiosis yep. between the two that's going to allow us to make progress you know, that, to reach people to educate people to organize people and uh, you know and the people who are out there doing that day-to-day -day stuff you know I've been I've done that a lot I've been at the factory gates. Um, selling newspapers. I've been on the subways <laughs> making speeches. I've, you know, been been on the front lines, um, the civil rights movement. I, uh, I joined the NAACP when I was 12 years old, the Congress of Racial Equality when I was 13. And I was a very, very active Oh God, don't make me feel any dumber than I already feel talking to you, Professor. At 13 years old, I was smoking pot and trying to get laid. You know, I mean, I can't. <laughs> please don't tell me. It's like talking with Chomsky. Chomsky's like, oh, you know, I wrote a book when I was, uh, you know, 13 years old. I mean, my God, you guys kill me. Um, look, I think one, <laughs> one that, that makes me feel so bad. Sergio's probably laughing back there, too. The, um, that's why I was so interested when I saw the transnational COVID-19 solidarity manual or manifesto. And that is because it brings together those worlds, you know, and one of the things that we've seen as a challenge in the last 15 years that I've done this work since coming home from the war is that we have the activists and organizers who are on the ground, maybe don't have that larger perspective. We have great academics and thinkers who are largely sort of tucked away in their own little world with, you know, sometimes very busy themselves, unable to come and speak or interact with people on the streets regularly, the more we can foster that kind of symbiosis, I think, we're, I mean, we're going to create the kind of movements we need, which are movements that think, but that also act. And oftentimes we get a lot of movements that act and aren't thinking too much. 
and we get people who are thinking a lot and not very active. And I've, I've seen that as a primary challenge for us to build the movements we need. And, and I remember my professors, my favorite professors during the Vietnam War, who were very critical of a lot of us in the new left because they thought we had simple kinds of ideas sometimes and kind of knee-jerk reactions to things. We hadn't learned the lessons that they had learned from the 30s and 40s and 50s. And they thought that their role was to support us, but give critical support to what we were doing to help us broaden our understanding and our visions. And I look back at a lot of things that I said and did during that time. And as much as my heart might have been in the right place, uh, I mean, I hadn't, I didn't have all the answers. I still don't have all the answers, you know, and and, uh, and none of us really do, which is why I sure, I, I shy away so much from a lot of the sectarianism on the left and the kind of rigid doctrinaire, my way or the highway yep. kind of approach. And I saw that in SDS and I saw that with all the different groups that I was involved with during during those periods. And instead of building the kind of broad coalitions that we could have done during that time, that could have maybe maintained the, the, the struggle much more and ended the war sooner and built the kind of world that we were trying to build, um, if things fell apart. So hopefully people are smarter now and, and and are more willing to think collectively, understand the ties, see what we have in common, and push forward in a progressive way that's going to begin to deal with some of these such serious, so serious problems that we're confronting. And the last thing I'll ask, a lot of the way in which you talk about history reminds me somewhat of Howard Zinn. It's this yeah. understanding that history isn't inevitable. It's an understanding that ordinary people have the power to change history. You mentioned Chalmers Johnson. Chalmers Johnson's books were some of the first books that found their way to my lap as a newly returned veteran coming home from the war. First, I read Blowback. Then I went back and read Sorrows of Empire. And then I read Nemesis. And that trilogy of books really changed my life as much as Michael Moore's film Fahrenheit 9-11 did, as much as Oliver's film Born on the Fourth of July did. And he makes the point that empires have two routes they can go. They can go the route of, and perhaps there's more, you, you might mention more, but let's say for the sake of conversation and time, you can go the route of the Roman Empire or you can go the route of the British Empire. You can exhaust yourself until collapse or you can break down pieces of your empire and maintain some semblance of democracy and a republic at home, a functioning society. Do you see... I also think there's a lot of people who sort of inevitably see the U.S. as just a collapsing empire. How important is it to you to, I think, give people that perspective that none of this is necessarily inevitable and that ordinary people have the power to make these changes, that it's not just up to kings and leaders and presidents and so forth? Well, Vince, let me first say that what's different about the United States, in my view, is that the United States is a collapsing empire with nuclear weapons. The other empires, as they were going down, did not have the capability, the means to draw the final curtain on all of humanity. The United States does. And what are the implications of that? That's why it's so important how the United States exits from the scene. And one of the things that's so troubling is that the United States treated other countries so badly when the United States was in charge. That's what Henry Wallace used to say. He said, if we treat, when we're on top now after World War II, as John Kennedy said, what happened to the Soviet Union was the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago having been destroyed and wiped out is what the Soviets suffered in World War II. Well, Wallace understood that. And he said, <clears throat> if the United States treats the Soviet Union so badly, now that we're on top, now that we've come out of World War II so well, how will the Soviet Union treat us if, when, if and when they supersede us, when they leapfrog us, when they are, are the dominant force in the world? 
And the same thing goes with China. I'm afraid maybe it's too late already. If the United States has set a different example and, and you know, and treated China in a friendlier, more collegial way, more understanding way, maybe China would not be behaving in some of the ways it behaves now that I don't like. Maybe, you know, China doesn't need to be doing what it's doing in the South China Sea. It doesn't need to be militarizing the region. Not, I mean, in terms of the U.S., I could understand it to some extent, but in terms of Vietnam and Brunei and the, uh, the Philippines and Malaysia, I mean, I mean the, there's enough wealth to go around in the South China Sea that China could be sharing that wealth. But because they've got such a narrow, rigid view, it backfires on them. And so that gives the United States the ability to actually work with Vietnam and these other countries because China is behaving in such a belligerent and uh, selfish way in, in certain ways. Um, so, so I think that the danger that I see is that the United States is a declining empire. The estimate is that by 2050, China is going to have significantly by far the biggest economy in the world, followed by India, then the United States, and then there's going to be Brazil and Russia and a couple of others, <clears throat> although Bolsonaro might take care of Brazil for us. Um, the, so, so what happens with an empire that's declining, but still has is armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons? I mean, that, I don't know what, what that future means. Does the United States go down gracefully? Does the United States reorient to play the kind of positive role in the world? that we would like to see. Maybe it's still salvageable. I think there's still time to change the U.S. relation with China and Russia and to, to begin to work together. And maybe the Chinese leaders will be less uh, paranoid and defensive and authoritarian than they are. I and mean, they're really afraid of the people of China from what I see. And that to me is very, very distressing. But they're also afraid of, that they have real enemies, and including the United States, which threatens them. So we still have time because we're still here and because we have no choice but to be optimistic because there's still the possibility of turning things around globally. And there's even the possibility of having good leaders in the United States, Russia, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and go down the list. And um, I mean, there's, no, there's no guarantee that those with this kind of power are going to be able to dominate. And what we're trying to do in part is empower the people, you know, trying to say that it's the people's movements that really are going to determine the world. And the reason why these leaders are so afraid of people in their countries is because they know the power of grassroots movements and grassroots organizing. And we've seen it time and time again. So uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Um, no, you did. And, I, and I've already taken far more time than I told you I would take of yours. So the last thing I'll simply ask her, if you want to plug where people can, because I, I would love to continue the conversation at another time. I've already taken way too much of your time. And it, where can folks find information about the Transnational COVID-19 Solidarity Manifesto and any last words you'd sort of like to pass along to folks about that project and how they can plug in? Well, this just demonstrates what a lousy organizer I've become over the years. <laughs> we, have this, we have this great website where people can sign the manifesto, where they can get involved, where they can join our meetings because we're really just individuals where, who are open and excited and desirous of having as much input as possible. And now I'm not sure what the website is. Is it We'll post it. How about this? Oh, yeah. We'll we'll post it along with the interview. I also have a copy of the manifesto in my hand. So we'll post this for folks who are watching and listening. We will post this to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of our social media pages. It'll be available in the bio on the YouTube page as well. And we'll also put it on our website eventually. So we'll do that. So, thank you so much. I, I mean, I encourage people to write to us, to join our meetings, to help us spread the message, to get more signatures on the manifesto. We want this to expand exponentially. And that's the way movements grow. 
yep. you know, and, and we want them to, everybody to connect with their friends and colleagues around the world. We've got great organizations, Veterans for Peace and Code Pink and others that have endorsed the manifesto, a lot of organizations, but it's just beginning. This is, we just had our official launch yesterday and we had them two launches, nine in the morning, Eastern time and nine at night because we wanted to reach people all over the world, whatever time zones they were, they were in. So I was actually hoping to use parts of this manifesto uh, and apply it to some of our local and regional work. I wanted to distribute this amongst our regional allies because following the Bernie Sanders campaign, there's been, a, I think, a really interesting and deep discussion with people on the left, progressives and so forth, where to go from here. You know, many people do recognize that getting rid of Trump is a, is a tactical strategic priority in the short term. But even thinking longer, you know, what are the values we want to base ourselves on? We would like to go, even though we know the reforms that Bernie was pushing for are necessary, we would like to even go beyond those reforms. So how do we start to do that? I think Bernie would too. Yeah, I agree. I, I, one of the things that I was critical of Bernie for was going around saying he was a democratic socialist. Not because I'm critical of democratic socialism, right. but because Bernie wasn't a socialist. Right. You know, so why give the, our enemies more fodder than they already have by assuming a label that's going to only alienate certain people and allow them to cat, put them in a box uh, that a lot of people are going to react negatively to. And Bernie's programs were not even as progressive as Roosevelt's programs were during the New Deal. They were far better than anything I've seen out of the Democratic Party, certainly since George McGovern. But, you know, the, there were a lot of mistakes that the Sanders campaign made. And as you said before, one of them was not going after empire more aggressively. And it's, that yeah. one blew my mind. I don't mean this is the only time I might have cut you off, but that, that one blows my mind, Professor. And you know why? Because if you look back on the 2015 primaries, the only, not the only, but one of the most interesting dynamics of Trump's primary run was that he explicitly, at least rhetorically uh, and nominally, took on an anti-interventionist uh, sort of U.S. foreign policy, destroyed the democratic field by criticizing Jeb Bush, what George Bush did, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. As you mentioned earlier, poll after poll shows not just the majority of Democrats and independents want us out of Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Somalia, Africa, and so on. It's also the majority of Republicans, and it's the majority of veterans who've served in those wars. It's one of, I mean, the only way I can think about this is because there's no longer an anti-war movement. So coming from movement politics, thinking about this, say, from the perspective of a Howard Zinn or something, you know, the reason we're talking about climate change right now is not just because we have decent leaders who are talking about it, but because there's a movement in the streets demanding that people talk about climate change. I, I genuinely believe, I don't know this for sure, I, it's been a blind spot, I think, in some of Bernie's policies in the past, but you know, I think it's up to us. I mean, those who are listening or watching this and who are interested in, in you know, U.S. stopping U.S. empire, stopping militarism, stopping the proliferation of nuclear weapons and so forth. It's really up to us to create the kind of movements that force this issue on these leaders because they're not going to take on this issue, specifically U.S. empire and militarism, unless we make it happen. The good news for us is that the public sentiment is already there. I mean, I think we need, we just have to band together, connect it. It's connected to every other issue from systemic racism to prisons to the food production, to austerity and inequality at home, to so on and so forth, lacking money for education and healthcare while well, you're spending close to a trillion dollars a year on your empire, 5.7 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan, so on and so on. Hey, look at the insanity of Trump's budget that he, new budget that he yeah. proposed in February of this year, <clears throat> is called for cutting funding to the Centers for Disease Control by $1.2 billion and increasing funding for nuclear weapons by $7 billion. Right. I mean, just our priorities are so backward right now. And as you're saying, this the grassroots movements that are gonna push the Democratic Party to embrace progressive ideas. And in a lot of ways, that was a big reason why Trump won in 2016, because he could outflank Hillary from the left yep. when it came to NATO our policy. Uh, NATO uh, interventions, overseas interventions. Yep. Iraq war. 
I mean, yep. and a lot of it was lies what he was saying, but sure. but uh, but Hillary was so vulnerable. I mean, she was she could not attack him on the on his sexual assault against women because of Bill's track record. She could not attack him on his militarism because of her militarism. She is a hawk. She supported every war the United States ever even dreamed about. In fact, she critic she wanted to get us more involved in Syria. In Syria, yeah. Uh, you know, and and. I mean, on all the issues in which Trump should have been vulnerable, she was vulnerable. God, you're reminding me of, of, of Biden candidate. now, though. That's exactly what <laughs> You're scaring the... Uh, compromised uh, in the same ways. I think we're seeing more and more that the Tara Reid story is probably bogus. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the more that comes out about her and things she's said and done, the more dubious she seems to be as a credible witness on any of this. But Trump will still, that doesn't make any difference. Trump will still go after, compromise Biden on that. Right. He'll go after Biden on his uh, militarism. He'll even go after Biden on his stupid racial comments about Obama being clean and articulate and, right. and the things that he's voted for over the years and the questionable policies that, that Biden has advocated over the years. So Trump is a master at this and he will change the topic and he will take go on the offensive. Biden just seems so feeble and yeah. so ill-equipped to carry the fight. You know, I still have a lingering hope somewhere that Biden is going to recognize that he's not up to the task and is going to step aside and, in the interest of the country, say that somebody else should really run instead of him. And we know who that could be. But I'll, you know, I'll settle for Elizabeth Warren also. Right. Um, even though I have more disagreement with her on a lot of things than I do with Bernie, sure. that she's even weaker on foreign policy yeah. than Bernie is. But uh, this, you know, the China, the Biden actions, the way he's campaigning on China now, just reminds people of how bad he is. But it, it's again the fear of looking like you're when when trump is rallying the country against china and it's working because now the latest polls show that 60 percent or more of the american people have a strongly negative view toward china now that's right and so so it's beginning to work and the democratic party should be challenging that but biden is not doing that and given his worldview over the years he's not going to be a credible spokesperson for progressive values on certainly on foreign policy look i want to end on a positive note one i'm extremely impressed with the global solidarity manifesto Uh, i agree with all of the values and like i said we're going to try and actually implement them here locally and regionally connected with national international groups and i was able to thank you via email but i'd like to thank you as face to face as this terrible uh, two-dimensional interactions are but you know, I, I really do want to thank you because that 12-part series in the book, Companion for It, was the best summary of how I understood through years and years of, of researching and, and having great mentors from the 68 generation. Uh, it was the best encapsulation of how I understood U.S. foreign policy in one place um, and if you know me, the, those who are watching or listening who know me personally, uh, you know that I've either forced you to sit down and watch at least one or two episodes, or you know uh, that we've had screenings here that I've passed it around to as many people as I could. And so, yeah, I would just like to personally thank you, Professor, because um, that series is, it, it is, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important documentary series around, and it's one of the most important books around. If people really want to wrap their heads around U.S. history, U.S. foreign policy, what it means and how it helps us better understand the world today. So, you know, a thank you um, in a very personal way for that. Thank you, Vince, for saying that. And um, it, the, the documentaries are available on Netflix. So people can, people are stuck in the house. Uh, they can watch them and uh, see what we're talking about because, I mean, I love them. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of Oliver, and and one, among our biggest fans was Howard Zinn. And we were really sad that Howard passed away before the documentary series and the book aired. But Howard was a friend, and 
a spirit and a mentor. And, and it was really, it's not always the, everything about the details of, of people's history, but it's about the spirit of people's history. That, that, that is so important. And um, Howard appreciated what we were doing and was very, very supportive. So um, yeah, I'd love people to watch the documentaries and read the books. Uh, make sure you get the new edition of the book because the new edition we added 160 plus pages, mostly on the Donald Trump. So it takes us up to 2019. So um, oh, excellent! So getting it for the first time, please try to make sure you got the get the 2019 edition. Excellent. So thank you, thank you, Vince. This has been great. No, thank you. My name is Vince Emanuele. You've been watching Park Media, and we just got done speaking with Professor Peter Kuznick professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University, author of many books, and most recently, one of the co-founders of the Transnational COVID-19 Solidarity Manifesto, which will be available on our website and in our bio on YouTube. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.